The message today is over a larger portion of scripture that I planned, <laughs> uh, though it certainly won't be exhaustive in terms of what's there. I plan on looking at Genesis chapter 11, verse 10, all the way to chapter 12, verse 9. <laughs> um, mostly, we'll be talking about the details of Genesis chapter 11, verses 27 through 32. But I have to kind of dip into some things in chapter 12 to talk about these things in 11 the way I want to and to make it really clear. Um, so that's where we'll be. Um, I'm, we're approaching peak season for me, uh, work schedule-wise, and you all know that Stan generally takes over all the teaching duties during that time. So uh, this week and maybe next, maybe one more in there, but basically I'm kind of be done until like mid-January or something here pretty soon. So um, for me, that's kind of keeping me from wanting to launch out into this next section. But on the other end of things is the life of Abraham, I felt like the Lord had showed me some things there that was really the, the whole reason why I wanted to jump into Genesis to begin with. So it's like I'm this close, and now I'm, being, I'm kind of telling myself I can't get there. And so um, sort of not listen to myself, and I'm going to say a few things anyway. If I have to repeat them again later, that's fine. But uh, I want to say some things that I think, I hope will be very helpful as you think about Abraham and as you think about God's dealings with him. So um, here we are. Um, why don't we pray, and then we will read this section and dive right in after that. Heavenly Father, I ask you that um, you would make the details of this text uh, stand out to us as they should. That have the intended effect that we would uh, take from them what we ought to take from them. We wouldn't miss what's important. I pray you'd shape our thinking about Abraham and about your own involvement with men. Um, just help, Lord, we pray you refine our thinking. We want to think rightly about, uh, about everything you've revealed to us, but these things are all interrelated, and every time we learn something new about one truth, it, it helps us understand others more. And here we are in this book of beginnings, and... It's our desire to understand rightly um, how this all began and how um, uh, what your uh, dealings with men was like, what the first trajectory was, so that we understand better uh, the trajectory you have us on and your point and purpose in our life. So I ask for grace to that end. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, I've talked to you all along, and I said I was going to read this text, and I will just briefly. But I only say a couple of things. I've spoken to you all along about these toll dot sections in Genesis, and how you have the book is divided up in these sections, and um, and that's certainly true. Um, but I want to. Uh, we begin in chapter eleven, verse twenty-seven. This ver the first of kind of a really long toll dot section. And so it's a section, you know, there's a big, huge section of Genesis that's devoted to the toll dot section belonging to this person. And if I were to ask any of you of, you know, what is Genesis chapters 12 through like 25 about, we would all say, I hope, Abraham. And notice verse 27 of chapter 11. These are the generations of Terah. What in the world are we talking about Terah for, right? So this is all, so Genesis chapter eleven twenty seven 27, all the way to chapter 25 is what became of Terah. Well, who cares? I mean, those of us who know about Genesis, like, who is Terah? You know, I mean, tell me anything about this man. You probably can't tell me anything. If you could say anything at all, it'd be just from what we read just right here. And maybe you read ahead and you're thinking, oh yeah, he was Abram's father. 
and he had a couple other kids too. And that's like all you know. Uh, you find out some other details here, but this is it. So it's a very odd that this is all about Terah, and there's reasons for that which we'll get in. But I just want you to think about that, that um, as we read and how odd that is. Again, I'll, I'll spend some time talking about it. But uh, So beginning then in Genesis chapter 11, verse 10, uh, this is right after the story of the, the Tower of Babel and all that God has done there to fragment human society so that we are not united together in our rebellion and our apostasy against God. There, it's like it's better for us to be divided with each other and constantly all these divisions of politics and language and uh, nationality and geography, like it's better for us to be divided that way, so says God, than to be all united together and opposing God in unity. Not that, any of, not that any of these nations are, well, they're the righteous ones and they're seeking God and the others aren't. It wasn't that way, but just that they weren't unified in, what, in their rebellion against God. It was something new that happened in the world at the Tower of Babel. Under Nimrod's leadership, right, humanity united in a, a, a higher-handed form of rebellion than we've ever seen in the world until that point. And God faithfully didn't destroy them. He was faithful to His promise. He merely frustrated their plans and continued on and sovereignly sent them across the world, which they were unwilling to do in their rebellion against Him. And so we pick up then kind of back again in the middle of that time period with Shem, beginning all the way back with Noah's first, uh, no, one of Noah's sons, um, maybe not the oldest. Uh, these are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Arpachshad, two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Arpachshad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arpachshad had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah. Then Arpachshad lived after he fathered Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. And Shelah lived after he fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Ru. And Peleg lived after he fathered Ru 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ru had lived 32 years, he fathered Sarug. And Ru lived after he fathered Sarug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sarug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor. And Sarug lived after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. And Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So notice just quickly, though, there are two Nahors. Nahar, Nahor fathered Terah, and then Terah named one of his sons after his father, Nahor. Um, then verse 27. So that ends. That, that's like all that, you know, I told you that every one of these genealogies has like an agenda and something it's trying to do. And you might get to the end of this genealogy and say, what are you trying to do? Because we just move on to another genealogy or to another uh, told dot section. And we'll talk about that in, in a minute, but let's just keep reading. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarah was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house 
to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the, the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At, the, at that time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country to the, uh, on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. All right. Um, I want to begin and talk first about this uh, Genesis chapter 11, verses 10 through 26, this <coughs> told out section of Shem. And the first question we might ask is why give this genealogy? Why is it even here? Um, I think the purpose uh, is uh, maybe twofold. One is to connect Abraham to Noah to Adam. Okay, I'll talk about that in just a minute. To connect, so one purpose is to connect Abram to Noah to Adam, to get us back and just show you the, the line, in a sense, how Abram's connected to Adam. Um, but uh, also, um, I think, to build anticipation uh, for a new movement, right? You, get this, you have this genealogy where it's just kind of, it's like nothing changes. They've told you kind of about some of the things that were happening in this time period. And you're told this list, and at no point are you told anything different about these men. And all these other genealogies, there's at some point in there, they insert some details about someone who stands out you need to know a little bit about. There's, you don't need to know about any of these guys. It's just, in a sense, unimportant. They just go from one, from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next, and we get down, and then here's this guy, and he had some kids. Now we're ready to move on. And it's like, it's just kind of this lull where you're kind of assuming everything is continuing as it's been. The people are in a sense, cursed of God, they're, they're spread out, they're, they're going their separate ways, and we're just kind of going down through history, and that's all you get. And then it stops. The genealogy stops, and we move in another direction. So the question is, okay, what's going to happen now with all this blessing and uh, that God had promised? Um, you remember um, God had promised, or, or rather Noah uh, had pronounced a curse upon Ham and his line and a blessing upon the God of Shem. So there was some blessing connected to Shem in his relationship with God. The God of Shem. Blessed be the God of Shem. So Shem and his family line somehow is the one that where this blessing is going to take place and where God is going to move and act. And so it's significant. So we pick up with the, the genealogy of Shem. And lo and behold, we end up with this man named Abram. And that's where the story really takes off for us. But so for those two reasons. Um, first of all, uh, just to connect uh, Abram with Noah and Adam, and then also um, to get us again thinking about uh, the blessing. Why pick up with the, with the generations of Shem? Because he's the one. You ought to be asking the question, well, Noah had done two things. He had cursed Ham, and then he had blessed his other children, but specifically, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. So what's going to happen there? Well, we pick up with Shem's descendants, and we just have a straight genealogy until we get to where God begins to actually act on that blessing. So that's where we are. So this thing about connecting Abram, uh, Abraham to Noah and to Adam you got to remember and think about this. Adam was uh, blessed by God to rule the world, to have dominion on the earth. And a promise after the fall was made by God that a seed, would a, a seed from Adam and from Eve would 
restore man back to peace with God and back to righteousness in God's creation. That this was going to happen. Um, there was going to be an undoing and an overthrowing of the devil and his work. This seed, this descendant was going to win triumphantly in what was going to be a bruising conflict with the devil. Right? He was going to win in this conflict with our ancient enemy. So this genealogy, together with the Genesis 5 genealogy, connect Abram to that promise and to that hope, which, as we've seen already, is the promise and the hope that has been driving Moses' narrative so far. What Moses writes has been driven by this searching for this promise to come to pass in the anticipation of it. Um, it also connects Abraham or Abram uh, to this same hope through a line of men that while absolutely imperfect and falling short of the righteousness which was necessary to obtain that victory, right, in order to get us back there, we had to, I mean, we needed a man like Christ. We know that now. But there was a level of, of overthrowing and of winning against the devil that was necessary that no man possessed until that point. And no one in this lineage in anywhere in Genesis so far, has possessed that level of righteousness and of, of moral ability and religious fervor. There's no man like it. So even though everyone is falling short, nonetheless, this line from Adam to Abram has contained some who were looking to that hope, who were trusting God to bring it to pass, and some of them even were living in such a way as to lend credibility to the reality of their trust in God. I mean, we know this to be true. There are people, you might think, who uh, you know, who believe certain things, maybe you call them superstitions, and in some ways they kind of act on it, but they don't really live their life based on those superstitions. But when something comes up, they go, oh yeah, I believe that. And there's a lot of these guys probably here, and there are in these genealogies, but there are some of these people who their lives really reflected it right on through. You think, for instance, of Enos. You know, here's a guy, or of Enoch. So here's a guy who was walking with God. You know, Noah was such a man for a great portion of his life, right? Was righteous in his generation. Was walking with God. There, there were some men who stood out. Their whole lives had just had the flavor of righteousness. You would have wanted to know them and have walked with them. But that's kind of as high as it gets. There were men like Shem, who, you know, Noah looks at his sons and he says, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. There's something about Shem, he says, he's, he's serving God. God is his God. Um, Noah, Lamech, who named Noah, Enoch, and Seth, some of these men. Now, in this genealogy now, now we've talked a little bit about some of the purpose about things, um, there is, I want to talk just in terms of a detail here, there is at least one, I want to say, missing name. <laughs> There's at least one missing name in our Bibles. And we can prove that by going to Luke chapter uh, 3. If you turn, keep your finger in Genesis 11, we're going to flip back and forth here. And if you turn to Luke chapter 3, I just want you to see this. In Luke chapter 3, verses... 23, Luke begins, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph. And he just begins to go back. The son of Heli, the son of uh, Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai. And he just keeps going. And you get all the way back, look at verse 38, all the way down to verse 38. The son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Luke's making a point that Jesus is not just a son of man, but he's a son of God. But along the way, he gives this list where he's naming all these men. And in this list, if you go down, if you find in verse 36, Noah. And kind of reading backwards into the names, we say, you know, Shem. And that's where our list starts here, Shem. Then you have Arpexod, which you have Arpexod here. Right, then you have, in Genesis, you have Shelah. Well, um, you have Canaan. Here, Luke says Canaan. 
which is the second Canaan he's mentioned on his way from God all the way to Jesus. So Canaan. Then in verse 35, Luke says Shelah and then Eber. What we have here, we have Shelah and then Eber. And what you notice if you were to go through is that this name Canaan is inserted. Where did Luke get this? Well, he got this from his Greek copy of the Old Testament is where he got it. And it's not in any of, of our best Hebrew manuscripts, in any of them. It's just in this, these Greek ones. And so it's, that's why it's not in our Old Testaments. But Luke, you know, gets it from there. That's where he gets it. And, I, and he's inspired, right? This is breathed out by God. So I've got to hold to that name being there. How, whatever Luke's source was, and it, we know what it was, it was the, the Septuagint. And so that's right. That's a name that belongs there. It's not a lie to us. Which means then, is it inconsequential or not? I don't know. Um, it affects maybe some ways you might interpret this genealogy. There are a lot of men who say there are maybe lots of names and generations and things missing from this genealogy. And they do that, one, because that's their view of, gene of ancient genealogies to begin with. And they also do that in the face of these this guy lived this many years and he had this son and such and such. They do it in the face of that because they see that with this name here, you have ten names in a vertical genealogy. This guy had this one, had this one, had this one, had this one, down to the tenth name. And the tenth name in this case, if you have that name there, would be Terah. And that tenth name has three sons. And we move on to something else. And in Genesis chapter 5, this other genealogy where we have these these years and all this you have also, if you were to begin with Adam and go on, you have ten names, ten generations all the way down to Lamech, and then Lamech, uh, or sorry, ten names all the way down to Noah, and Noah has Shem, Ham, and Japheth, three sons. And so they're ten names vertically down, and then that last one, instead of giving the next three generations, you just give three of his sons. And you have that exact pattern in both of these genealogies. And so it's kind of a nice, neat pattern, and it's another reason people say that names are missing and that you can't really date things by these particular genealogies, and there are difficulties with it. And that may or may not be, but I want you to know about it because if you're looking through your Bible and you see that, I don't want you to think, you know, I want you to be aware of that discrepancy and kind of what some people do with it. Regardless of whether that, that matters to you at all, about whether we can date, how, how well we can date things beyond Abram, um, there, are, there is a, a similarity here that I want to um, bring out, uh, some parallels between Genesis 5 and 11. Again, I mentioned both genealogies, whether there's 10 names in the Genesis 5 and only 9 names in the Genesis 11, and then the three chil children are listed. Regardless, both genealogies do include this, include this list of vertical names and ends then with three brothers from the last person of the vertical list. Both lists also place these three brothers in an order which is not the birth order. They both place them with the one upon whom the blessing comes first. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then um, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Also... Um, Again, yeah, like I said, both of the names, uh, the first names are the ones who received the blessing from God and were blessed in their connection with God. So that's significant that it's, it's not, it, they're both ordered in that way, that the name that they put first is not the one necessarily who's the oldest. We know that Abram was not the oldest. We know it for a fact. Let me prove that to you just real quick. When Terah, verse, uh, Genesis eleven twenty six. when Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now, the way you or I might read that is to say, at the age of 70, he had three sons already, right? We know that's not true. We know it's not true. Here's how we know it's not true. Look at Genesis chapter 11, verse 25. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. When Terah dies, he's 205. So at 70 years, he's, he at least is a father. He's at least a first-time father, at least at that point. And at 205 years old, he dies. Now, after he's dead, Abram leaves Haran. Abram is 75 years old when he leaves Haran. 
which means um, he may have waited a number of years before he left Haran, even after his father died. But if he got up the next morning and left, he's only 75 years old, which means, he could, which means his father was 130 years old at a minimum, maybe older, when Abram was born. That's what that means. So Terah was at 130 or older, depends on how long Abram may have stuck around in Haran before he left, when Abram was born. Just mark it down. It has, that has to be. So we know Abram's not the oldest. He's probably the youngest by a long shot, probably. We know his older, at least one of his older brothers, probably his oldest brother, Haran, died while Terah was still alive. And while they were all still living there um, in, uh, in, in Ur of the Chaldeans, he dies. And so Abram's definitely not the oldest. We also know from the, in the other genealogy um, where it says Shem, Ham, and Japheth, we know Ham, who's the middle one listed all the time, is actually the youngest. And we know that because of what we read in Genesis chapter um, 9. Verse 24, when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, his youngest son was Ham. That's who that story is about. So Ham was the youngest. So these are not in the order of age. In fact, the ones that are brought out first in these genealogies are the ones who, upon whom the blessing came. Shem, we remember, is the one, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Moses knows that, and so every time he mentions these three sons, he mentions Shem first, because he's first in his mind. He's wanting you to be thinking about Shem, and he, think, and he gives the blessing upon the Lord in connection with Shem. And we come now to the descendants of Shem. Now we get down to here, and when Terah had lived seven years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And again, we, if you haven't read Genesis yet, you don't know that Abram, Nahor, and Haran is different than their birth age or anything else. But I'm just telling you, Moses has put Abram first, not because he's oldest, but because he's the one of interest. He's the one who, who the story will we'll find is the one who's of significance. So that's uh, just a point of, of detail there that we see, but it, you see it there. It's, it's deliberate. Abram is the one who's brought forward as the one upon whom the blessing will come. If you've been attentive to the way that things have already been worked out, you'll say, Abram, he's He's going to be the one that's significant. You find that out on just a few sentences later, uh, but it's there already. But there's a really helpful point to realize from this genealogy and the details which follow it into the next Toldot section. And I've already kind of mentioned it at the very beginning of the message. And that is that it ends with Terah and his sons. And the next genealogy asks the question, okay, so what happened with Terah? It doesn't begin with Abraham, who is undoubtedly, uh, you know, he's the one, the subject undoubtedly of almost the entire next Toldot section. It's all about Abram. So why are we just calling it the Tol Toldot of Terah? It's very, a little bit confusing. And it's more so when you look at, if you go back to Genesis chapter 5 and 6. In Genesis 5, these are the gener book of the generations of Adam, who's been a major player up until that point. And that goes all the way down um, to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. These are the generations of Noah, who's a big player, right? You had that genealogy in Genesis chapter 5. It ends, Noah's the last one, and it, and it just tells us he was 500 years old. He had these children. And so... We're not, we're not surprised when, you know, that genealogy, that genealogical list went 10 names and ended with Noah. He's the subject. He's the one. It's not his sons that we're talking about. We're talking about the last man in the, the list of names before we divided it up. So you would think that when you get here to Genesis 11 and you read this list of names and the last one is Terah and then he has these children, you're not shocked when it says, now these are the generations of Terah. In your mind, you're thinking, yeah, what is God going to do through Terah? Because the last time we had a genealogy that ended like this, it was with Noah, and God did something incredible with Noah. And Noah was a standout man. 
what is this man Terah like? And you, like, you read a few verses and he's dead. And we're talking about his boy. It's just odd. So why in the world, why not go on to Abram? Why not end the genealogy with Abram and then go from there? Why not do that? Well, a couple reasons. One, uh, first of all, we know from God's dealings, those of us who know the story of Abram and Abraham, know that a big part of the unfolding work of God in his life was providing him, chil- him children. So we're not going to end this genealogy with, and these are all the kids that he had. Like, we don't want to do that. You don't need to know that yet. You need to read and watch this plan of God unfold and see how it happens and feel this. The other reason is it's important for you to not think of Abram as this standout man when God called him. You need to be thinking that things have continued on so long, and here we get to Terah, and what about Terah? Well, he had these kids, and then he died, and then this is one of his boys, and then God spoke. And the details we get at the end of Genesis chapter 11... Every single one is designed to make you think not very highly of Abram. You're just, he's an out and out pagan. He's nobody special, nobody of significance. And that's what we're going to look at just a little bit today. I'm just going to kind of tear Abraham down in your mind so that you, re, re, so that you think more rightly about God's dealings with him. So it's not Abram's story as it begins, though we know it turns into that, but it's the story of this is what came of Terah. There was a, a line from Shem that God had promised he was going that there was a bless, God was blessed in connection with someone in that line. But we've not seen anybody of significance come from there, and we get to Terah, and there's nothing significant there either. So it picks up and it's just very vanilla. It's not like, now Noah had favor with God. Noah was a righteous man. It's nothing like that. We're not told about Terah's righteousness and his faithfulness to God and how he stood apart in Ur of the Chaldeans for the one true God. We're not told anything like that. In fact, we're told kind of the opposite. And you see that in the details, and let me help you see it. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, in the land of his kindred, in Ur of the Chaldeans. Now that is just doesn't mean much of anything to you. But first of all, he's out there in, among the Chaldeans. And these are a people who were largely responsible for building, and continuing to build, these ziggurats. These, the things that you had like in, in Babylon, the Tower of Babel, they continue. In fact, there is to this day, in a place called Earl Ur Kaldan in Iran, there is like the most preserved ziggurat we even have. It's there. This is where like all scholars say like this is the place where Ur was. This is this city, Ur of the Chaldeans. And this was this were all of his family. They were there. And that's where they lived in Ur of the Chaldeans, kind of the, the capital of that brand of paganism. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Is- Iscah. So, um, these, Abram takes a wife, and Nahor takes a wife. Well, Abram's wife, Sarai. Uh, some of you women, you may know, just because you've, you've, you've had daughters and you've wanted to find a name. Any of you know what the name, we, or, Sarai is later changed to Sarah, right? What does the name Sarah mean? Anyone tell me? It means princess. It's like, oh, what a great name. Well, Sarai also means princess. And um, scholars, the general consensus is that if you look at her name, it's very, very similar to basically the moon goddess in this pagan religion. So it doesn't mean that anything about Sarai and her own beliefs, but at least she comes from a family where someone, the person who named her, likely named her after this goddess. She carries the name of the false gods. That's her name. That's who she is. And that's who Abram chooses as a wife. Milcah. Well, in the same form of paganism, Milcah is almost, it's so similar to the name of, in their 
idea of the gods. The, the, uh, sorry, the actual moon goddess. Uh, Sarai is the daughter of the moon goddess. Milcah is the moon goddess. So it's, they're named like princess and queen of, that is the false gods. I mean, the, the false moon god and her daughter. That's the names that they bear, Sarai and Milcah. Sarai means princess, Milcah is queen. She's the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iska. Now, there's some question as to who Milcah is and who her father is. Is her father Haran, the same Haran who's Abram and Nahor's brother, maybe, or is it a different Haran? Right, so it's either telling us that Nahor married his niece, right, at this stage, married his niece, or that there's a different Haran, and this Haran was the father of Milcah and Iska. It's a different, you need to understand it's a different Haran. There were two Harans in order to help you distinguish, well, there's one Haran, he died. This other Haran, he had a couple daughters, and one of those daughters is the one who um, Nahor married. I think it's likely that idea, that it's separating these two Harans so we don't get them confused. Now, Sarai was barren, and she had no child. Now, that's significant because Abram's the one who's brought forward as the one who's going to, in, this, in the end of this genealogy, is the one who maybe is going to have this blessing. Um, but he's got no kids, so there's no, this idea that a seed from the woman is going to come is not likely. The, the woman who he's married to is barren, she has no child. We read, Terah took Abram his son and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, um, let me... I read that portion and I actually wanted to get a little further in my notes before I did. So let me just give you a couple things first. We've talked about Abram as a pagan. And I want you to turn, rather than just to kind of take my word for it, I hope you are aware of this text already. But uh, for those of us who kind of exalt Abram too much and think he was kind of always following God, I want to t you to turn with me to the end of the book of Joshua, chapter 24, where this is just clearly stated that, that Abram didn't know God. In Joshua chapter 24, beginning in verse 1, what do we know about Abram? Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. Isn't that one of the first places that we saw that Abram visited just a minute ago? Here he comes. They all come to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham, and of Nahor, and they served other gods. They served other gods. So it's just a fact. Abram was a pagan, actively involved in serving other gods. And his wife is named, more than likely, I mean, we know that just from the, from the name itself and linguistical studies, but when, we told, when we're told that Abram was actively serving these other gods, it becomes really likely that Sarai maybe was even in some way connected to the service of the same false god, and that's what brought about this whole union to begin with. And same with Nahor, he marries Milcah. So, we're told here, Terah, Abraham, and Nahor all were serving other gods in that land. Ur of the Chaldeans. Um, but then there's this other interesting thing that's said in Genesis chapter 31. Jacob and Laban are arguing back and forth, and they just set up this pillar where... Laban says, okay, you don't go over here on this side to do me harm, and I won't go on that side to do you harm. In verse 53, Laban speaks to, um, to Jacob and says, 
the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. And I, you could read that as saying that Laban understands that the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor and the God of their father, who would be Terah, is the true God. Or you could read it as he's kind of, because Laban's still serving false gods, remember? Rachel stole his God. His God. Why did you steal my gods? Which, what a pathetic statement that is. You stole my gods. That's re- I'm glad I don't serve a God that can be stolen. Um, but so this is, this is the way it is. And so he might have in mind, you know, the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of their father, he might be thinking these, these gods that I lost just a minute ago or whatever, swear by those. And Jacob says, I swear by the fear, by the fear of my father Isaac, meaning the true God. Or it could be, it could be that, or it could be that he's, Laban is saying, no, the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their father is the true God, or the same God that you're serving, whether Laban thinks he's true or not, that same God, served by the God that, swear by the God that you believe in. In which case, Laban would be kind of evidencing that he's aware of the fact that Abraham, Nahor, and their father weren't, at some point at least, weren't serving the same gods that, they, that he serves. There was some other God they were following. So here's how I kind of put this together. Along with, um, let let me give you one other kind of conflicting bit of data, and we'll kind of maybe try to get all that together. Verse 31 of Genesis 11 says, Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. So that text tells us that Here is Abram and Lot and Sarai and and, and Terah, and they're all there. And Terah says, you know what? We're going to get out of here. We're going to go to Canaan. Right? Terah took them to go to Canaan. Now, they stopped in Haran, and they settled there. They didn't stay for a night. They settled. They made a life there. They never made it. But then, in Genesis chapter 12, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. He goes all through that. Verse Chapter 12, verse 4, So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And there are other uh, texts, we won't go into all those uh, references I just didn't write down, that speak very clearly about this idea that God called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldeans. It's like, well, which one is it? So here's the way I understand this and put all this together. Abram was a total pagan. He's out there um, serving false gods with his dad, Terah, and his brother, Nahor, and his wife, and Nahor's wife, Milka. And this is their life. And suddenly God speaks to him and says, Go from your country and your kindred, the land of your birth, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Go. Right? And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There's something about this call that happened back there in Ur of the Chaldeans. And so, Abram goes, and Terah goes with him, and Sarai goes with him, and Lot goes with him, Haran's son. Why do they go? Well, here's the idea, as I understand it. Um, they're in, their, in this false religion. It's kind of like what happens with Balaam, right? But here's Balaam. And he's, he's uh, looking for all these, you know, he's the guy who kind of, uh, you can, Balaam's handy to have around. You want people to be cursed of God or cursed of whoever, whatever powers they may be, you're thinking. You go, you pay Balaam, he'll come and he'll pronounce a curse. So Balaam shows up and he does this kind of thing. And God actually shows up and he's terrified. He's, he's coming there to pronounce a curse on the people of God. And God shows up and says, you can't do it. And Balaam realizes that whatever he's dealt with before, he's got the real thing now, and he, doesn't, he is not willing in any way to go against what he's been told. Again and again. He wants to. He keeps taking more money. He says, I'll try again, and it doesn't work out, and he's just scared to death because God actually showed up. Here's Abram out here serving these false gods, and, so, and the true God showed up and gave him a word and said, go to this land, and I want you to 
and I'm going to make a great nation of you. And I'm, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. And, he's, and so he responds. And he doesn't know anything at all about this God except that he's real. That he showed up in a way that was more powerful than anything else. And of all the different gods that they're serving, he's not even too clear about which one this one is or what's going on, but he knows this one's real. And he's just, he just said, I'm going to choose the one that revealed himself to me this way. And it's not even a, cho a choice to say, the one true God I'm following. Just, this is the God I've made my God. I'm attaching myself to him, and I'm going to follow him wherever he says for me to go. Like, there's just very little, little understanding, but there's that. And so, he, he, what does he do? He tells his wife, he tells his dad, he tells Lot, and others. And, you know, Nahor has, has, has not gone on necessarily. But they go, and they leave, and they get as far as Haran, and they settle. For who knows what reason. Maybe Terah can't go any further. Maybe they're just weary from the journey, and they decide to stay there. And Abram's saying, I'll get there one day, but for right now, we're going to stop here. Who knows what. But there wasn't a willingness to press on all the way to get to the land of Canaan. Had to wait until after Terah dies. Terah dies, and it's as though... God either says again to Abram, or Abram remembers again the call of God to go, and he goes. And he finishes the journey, and he gets to Canaan, remembering these words from God. So, that's how I understand it. So what that means then, is that Abraham's, Abram's call and decision to go to Canaan was something of a conversion, right? Right? It wasn't necessarily a repudiation of all the other forms of idolatry that he was in, but it was a commitment to follow the God who'd revealed himself to him. I'm going to follow this God. Right? I'm going to hitch my wagon to him, and he's going to be the God I serve. I was serving these gods. Some God, a God, a, a living God, has revealed himself to me, and I'm going to follow him where he told me to go. Um... So, again, he chooses the God who spoke to him. And you can only say this, more learning to follow. Right? More learning to follow. So he's a total pagan. God and, and the divine, or a divine being, has spoken to him, and he says, I'm following him. And we get to the place where, at the end of his life, Abram's willing to sacrifice his own son in his utter trust of the one true God, who he knows is the one true God by the time it's all over. In the meantime, we have God stepping into Abram's life and teaching him about God, and teaching him about man's place with God. And that's what the whole story of Abram's about. It's not just you know, his growing faith, that's true, but all the things that God's doing in him, and through him, and putting him through. And you'll see Abraham falter and fail again and again and again. But the thing is, his faith is, keeps growing. God keeps showing him, working with him. It's incredible. But this is Abram's life. Um, at the beginning, he's just an absolute pagan. There was nothing... He's, he's not like Noah, who was walking with God who was blameless in his generation. This guy was serving false gods. He didn't even know who God was, it didn't seem. It's incredible. He's not a righteous man. You would not have spoken with Abram in Ur of the Chaldeans and thought, well, this guy stands apart and is set apart for God. You would have prayed for his soul as a lost man who was utterly blinded in his paganism. That was Abram. And God chose him. God chose him. This man and his pagan wife and his pagan family, there they were serving false gods. Which I hope lends so much credence to this idea where Paul says in Romans 3, let's look at a couple texts on this. It's just so helpful to see it's always been this way. None is righteous, no, not one. Right? No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. 
Abram wasn't out there searching for the real God. He was searching for power, for influence, for ability, for security against what worried him. Death and heartache and loss and not having a name, just like all of his ancestors were. Very much partaking in the fragmented rebellion against God from, since Babel. Living in the town and, in, and taking wives who are, have names connected to the, the same sort of enterprise that Babel was all about. It's incredible. He couldn't have been more uh, outside, you might say, the will of God. He couldn't be more opposed to God. There he was, serving other gods. None are righteous. Beloved, no, not one. Or Titus 3. For we ourselves were once foolish. Just think, I mean, think of this. Certainly it applies to us, we ourselves. But this, we're talking about Abram, right? We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, Slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works by us, works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This blessing that comes to us through the promise God made to Abram. What a thing. That's Abram's life in a nutshell, right? I mean, foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures. But when the kindness of God appeared... Oh, the difference it made in Abram's life. I mean, this guy, Abram, is going to be called the father of the faithful. He's going to be, it's, he's going to be a blessing. All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through this pagan? Yes, absolutely. What a thing. Ephesians 2. Verse 1, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. That's exactly what Abraham was, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, I want to take that portion of that text and just apply it to Abram. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We exalt Abraham and his faith up a lot. Anyway, far too much. We exalt, I, I want to lift up his faith and model it, but I don't want to lift up the man as he was. Right? Here he was, just like the rest of mankind. Nothing great about him. Was saved by God's grace through faith. It wasn't a result of his own doing. It was just the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Whatever good works you have, what are they? We are His workmanship. You see that in Abram's life. From where he was, this pagan, 75 years old, eventually before he finally got on with what God told him to do, to where he is at the end of his life, you see, he is God, you see God working in his life, crafting him, teaching him, shaping him, being patient with him, protecting him from his own foils and his mistakes and his sins, 
God is working in his life. He is God's workmanship. By the time it's all done, he's the father of the faithful. It's incredible. And we can recount stories of the great faith of Abraham to stir you and to say, won't you believe God for this far lesser thing in your own life? Look what Abraham did. Look at the way Abraham believed God. It's incredible. That's where he gets to. There's none of you who would have wanted to imitate the life of Abram, but all of us want to imitate the life of Abraham. And that's God's doing. All of it is owing to God. What a thing. We get to the place. So I, I want to say this. Ab God's calling of Abram is his direct response to the to the rebellion that humanity has exhibited in the Tower of Babel. Humanity, I mean, what's going to come of humanity? Well, what's going to come, humanly speaking, of even the blessings we get, you know, from Shem and the, whatever his relationship is with God, is nobody even cares to seek God and search for God at all. We're all united in our rebellion against him. And there's this curse that comes upon us again, in a sense. All the, you know, the, the language barriers and these kind of things, all this exists because of, a as a consequence of our sin. It's a, you know, various languages are a monument to God's judgment on sin. That's what they are. This is where we've, we're left with. And it's like nothing is going to, if we've been looking and reading Genesis rightly, we keep saying, when is this, when is this going to happen? When is God going to bless? When is, are these things going to, the promise is going to come to pass? There it is not. I mean, even, when you start over with this righteous man who didn't partic participate at all in the sins of the world, at his time, he stood apart, you start over with him, and it's just a few genera it's just a short while afterwards, you've got curses being pronounced, and not long after that, everybody's in, united in rebellion against God, and God has to come in judgment again. There's just no hope. So what's going to happen? Well, what happens is what God is going to do is he's going to work his plan in a way you never would expect it. He's going to take one of these guys who's out there Maybe even some kind of a priest out there in Ur of the Chaldeans serving these false gods. He's going to take that guy and through the most unlikeliest and humble and humiliating kinds of circumstances in his family, bless the whole world. And it's going to come against obstacle after obstacle and obstacle and failure after failure after failure from these people. But God's going to do it. He's going to bring it to pass. So what happened from God's creation? He created it and it was very good. And through sin and through the work of men, it, has, it was ruined, God, it was wrecked, God wrecked humanity, God started a, kind of started a new thing and said, I'm not going to wreck it all again, and, but they wrecked it, we wrecked it right away, as soon as we could, in a unified way. And so, but God said, He's not going to wreck it again, He's going to bless, He's going to bring His blessing up through that wreckage that we've made. And but God begins this new creative work. He takes this total disaster and begins with just through this one man to begin in such a small way to begin to teach him and to train him about the ways of God and eventually becomes a nation, eventually becomes a Messiah and a whole new covenant. And the blessing comes. It's, it's wonderful in how small it begins and how insignificant it begins and how pagan it begins. Right? We need to think this way even about our own selves. Right? We tend to try to commend ourselves to God, even as believers, where we know we've got nothing to offer ourselves to God, nothing but the blood, right? Nothing but the blood. But we tend to kind of, in our life, kind of, there's some level of righteousness which that kind of have as leverage with God or something, or we tend to look out at the lost world and think, well, God wouldn't say, this guy's kind of maybe too far gone. This other one, they're kind of a little closer to the full, we see things happening. They're the ones, you know, we're interested in them. We'll pray for this one and not this other one. And that's not the way it is. God didn't need anything. Abraham wasn't, you know, very aware of God, kind of dabbling with these ancient writings that spoke of a true God. Like, that wasn't what was going on. God just spoke to him right in the middle of his paganism. It was miraculous. He lifted the veil, in a sense, and showed him who he was. began something totally new. So, you might think of Abraham and these early chapters here in 12, the end of 11 and 12, as 
kind of the restoration of this blessing for man begins. At the beginning of this blessing when we store it to man. It's just starting out. It had roots before. We saw it a little bit already. Some things God was promising still to do. As Noah spoke of this blessing upon Shem and Lamech was looking to God and some men were calling upon the name of the Lord. That happened here and there in spotty ways. Here we see God move in a new way. Chose the man and said, you're going to be a blessing. I'm going to make it so. And Abram had nothing to begin with, had nothing at all to do with it. There was nothing to commend himself to God. He didn't stand out above anybody else as a candidate. Uh, he wasn't, you know, if you looked out of the world and said, who, if God were to ask, who can I use? You know, who has commended themselves to me as a great vehicle of blessing to the world? There was no one. None righteous. I mean, he was serving false gods. This is the way it is, beloved. God isn't dependent on us. He doesn't need our righteousness. He doesn't save us on that basis. He doesn't move in the world on the basis of those who have committed themselves to him. Right? The Jews, Paul says over and over to the Romans, or in his letter to the Romans, there's no advantage in that sense. There's a great advantage in that you have the words of God. You can learn from God. But there's no advantage in terms of you just being more righteous because you have these words. No one has advantage in that way. We're all condemned before God. Needing His grace. Well, that's essentially what I wanted to share today about Abram. Just that he was of significance, and maybe, maybe the lesser of men in early Chaldeans. Any 